I'm Bob Duhamel, and I am having a root beer. While I'm here, I can use the soda straw to explain how voltage, current, and resistance interact in electronics. Electricity is a fluid. People usually think of a fluid as a liquid, like water, but a gas is also a fluid. The air around me is a fluid. The air is made up of gazillions of oxygen and nitrogen molecules that are free to float around. And as they float around, they bump into each other, they bump into me, they bump into objects. And as they bump into things, they impart a force that we call air pressure. I have here an empty soda straw. Well, it's empty except for the air inside it. And that air is free to move around inside the straw. Some molecules might move one way, but other molecules will move the other way to take their place. And the molecules will stay evenly distributed and the air pressure inside the straw will be the same everywhere. Let's see what happens if I put a higher pressure on one side and a lower pressure on the other. I'll do that by blowing through it. When I blew into the straw, there was a higher pressure on this side which forced air into the straw and that displaced the molecules in there and caused them to leave the other side of the straw, making an air current inside the straw. Now even though I did put a higher pressure on this side than this side, the pressure difference was too small to measure without very sensitive gauges. So for all intents and purposes, even though I had air moving through the straw and I did have a higher pressure on one side than the other, the air pressure was the same everywhere in the straw. Now I'm going to pinch the straw in the middle. Not all the way through, just mostly. Well, this is restricting the flow of air from one side to the other, but there's no impetus to make the air flow. So everything is pretty much the same. The air pressure is the same on both sides of the pinch. But now let's see what happens when I blow through it. Well, that was different. Now, with this restriction in the middle, when I have had air current flowing through, two things happened. One, this restricted the flow, so I had less air flowing through the straw. Also, air backed up on this side of the restriction where I was blowing the air in, and so I had a higher pressure on this side than on that side. So, when I had the restriction and I had air current flowing through the straw, I had a difference in pressure, a higher pressure where the air was going in and a lower pressure where the air was coming out. This is a piece of copper wire. It is common copper house wiring and it is made up of gazillions of copper atoms. And for every one of those atoms, there is one electron that is free to move around inside this mass of copper. So there are gazillions of electrons floating around inside this copper, just like the soda straw had gazillions of air molecules floating around inside it. And these electrons exert a force on each other that is much like air pressure. We call that force voltage. And as long as these electrons are evenly distributed, the voltage is the same anywhere inside this piece of wire. If I can increase the electron pressure or voltage on this side and decrease it on this side and somehow inject electrons here and take them out here, I can get an electron flow or electrical current to flow through this wire. There is a device that can pump electrons through this wire and it's called a battery. So if I hook up the negative terminal of a battery here and the positive terminal here, it will increase the voltage here, decrease it there, and I will have an electric current flowing through the wire. Even if I have a higher voltage here and a lower voltage here, and therefore have a current flowing through here, the difference in voltage will be very difficult to measure. So for all intents and purposes, with no restriction and a current flow, I still have the same voltage anywhere in this wire. Could I pinch this down and make a restriction like I did with the soda straw? Actually, I could, but that's not a practical way to do it. In electronics, we have devices called resistors. This is a particularly large one. It shows up well on the camera, but they come in all shapes and sizes. If I cut this wire in half and solder the ends to the resistor, it works the same as pinching down the soda straw. And so now, if I have no current flowing through the wire, the voltage is the same everywhere. But if I cause current to flow through this wire, two things happen. One, the resistor acts like the restriction and restricts the flow of electricity. I have less current flowing. But also, the electrons bunch up on the side where they enter the resistor and cause a higher pressure or higher voltage, and there's a lower pressure or lower voltage on the other side. 
So the rules are, if I have a conductor and no current flow, the voltage is the same everywhere in the wire. If I have current flowing through there, there's a tiny difference in voltage from one side to the other, but it's so small that for all intents and purposes, the voltage is still the same everywhere. If I put a resistor in the wire, but there's no current flow, the voltage is still the same everywhere. But if I have resistance and current flow, then I have a backup of voltage. I have a higher voltage where the current enters the resistor and a lower voltage where the current exits the resistor. So a resistor does two things. One, it restricts the flow of current and it causes a voltage difference from one side to the other. If I double my current, that voltage difference doubles. If I double my resistance, that voltage difference doubles. We have established that electricity is a fluid. This is a concept that has been largely lost in modern science. However, as recently as 150 years ago, electricity was called electrical fluid. Some people use water in a hose as a model for electricity, but water is a liquid and liquids are not compressible. Electricity is clearly compressible, so electricity acts more like a gas than a liquid. We have also established that we can make electricity flow through a conductor much like we can make air flow through a soda straw. When we have electrical current flowing through a conductor and there is resistance to that flow, we have a backup of electrical pressure or voltage where the current enters the resistance and a drop in voltage where the current exits the resistor. So there is a voltage difference from one side to the other of the resistance. If we don't have the current flow, then the voltage is the same from one side to the other. If we have a conductor with no resistance, unless I have a significantly high current flow, the difference in voltage from one end to the other is minuscule, and for all intents and purposes, the voltage is the same everywhere along the conductor. Only when we have both current and resistance do we have the voltage difference from one side to the other. Let's see how these rules apply to different scenarios. This is the schematic symbol for a resistor. In much of the world, they use a rectangle, in the US, we tend to use a zigzag line. These other lines represent conductors connected to that resistor. When we are examining electronic circuits, we often have to zero in on individual resistors and pretty much ignore what's going on around them. So we're going to look at this in such a way that we don't know what's going on over there and we don't know what's going on over here. All we are interested in is what's going on at this resistor. Now let's measure some voltages and see what that resistor is doing. Let's say I put a voltmeter here and I measure 6.3 volts. And then I put a voltmeter over here and measure 6.3 volts. What does that tell us about the resistor? Well, we know for the voltages to be different, there must be two things. There must be resistance and there must be current. So something's missing here. Either there is no resistance here at all, or there is no current flowing through that resistor. Can we have a resistor with no resistance? Well, yes, it could be defective and a short circuit and therefore have no resistance. Also, all electrical components act like a resistor in one way or another. And if they are defective and we are expecting some resistance and there is none, then we will see the same voltage on one side as the other. So either there is no resistance or there is no current. Let's put a current meter here and see what that tells us. This is the schematic symbol for a current meter or ammeter. And the way I have it in the circuit, whatever current flows through this resistor in either direction must also go through the current meter. So the current meter will tell us how much current is flowing through that resistor. Let's see what it tells us. It says zero amps. So there is no current flowing through that resistor. So if we have resistance and no current, we expect the voltage to be the same on both sides. So this is acting like a normal resistor. Now let's change the situation and see what we can find out. So now the voltage has increased to seven volts here and decreased to six volts here. That looks very much like we must have a resistance with current flowing through it. And we have the higher voltage here and the lower voltage here. So we have the higher voltage where the current enters the resistance and the lower voltage where the current exits the resistance. So the current appears to be flowing in that direction. 
Let's see what the current meter says. It says 1 amp. While we're here, let's define what an amp is. The ampere, or amp for short, is one of the easier quantities for us to wrap our minds around in electronics. All we do is count the number of electrons passing by in a second, and we get so many electrons per second, we have 1 amp. Let's see how many electrons that is. And uh, yes, I do have to cheat on this. We have 6, 2, 4, 1, 5, 0, 9, 3, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Let's see if I got that right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So 18 places after the 6. That's 6 quintillion, 241 quadrillion, 509 trillion, 340 billion electrons, or 6.24 times 10 to the power of 18 electrons per second gives us one amp of current. Now that we have defined the amp, we can take this a step further and define one of the other important quantities in electronics, and that is the measurement of resistance, which we measure in a unit called the ohm, named after Georg Simon Ohm, who read some papers written by Henry Cavendish and wrote another paper in which he defined the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance and he got the unit of resistance named after him, the ohm. So let's look at what we have here. We have established that we have one amp of current, and how much voltage do we have here? Well, seven volts here and six volts here. The difference is one volt from one side to the other. So we have a voltage difference of one volt and a current of one amp. So by definition, that resistor is a one ohm resistor. We often use the Greek letter omega, as a symbol for an ohm. Let's see what happens if something in the circuitry around this resistor causes this current to double to 2 amps. So what has happened? Current doubled to 2 amps. Notice this voltage went higher and this voltage went lower. By how much? This voltage went up to 7.5, this one went down to 5.5, and so now the difference is how many volts? Two volt difference. So we doubled the current. It caused the voltage across the resistor to double. Now, did the voltage double because the current doubled? Or did the current double because the voltage doubled? I really can't tell. Something happened out here to either double the voltage, which caused the current to double, or it doubled the current, which caused the voltage to double. I can't tell. But the voltage and the current are inseparably connected with each other. There is a formula that we can use to calculate how much current we will have if we know the voltage. And that is called Ohm's Law. And this is the first fundamental law of electronics. In electronics, we work with voltage measured in volts, current measured in amps, and resistance measured in ohms. In international units, they are represented by E for voltage, I for current, and R for resistance. Ohm's law tells us the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And this formula mainly tells us, if you know your voltage, divide into it. If you don't know your voltage, multiply. So let's say we have a resistor. We have a current meter in series with that resistor to tell us how much current is flowing through it, and we measure the voltage on each side, and let's say we find 10 volts on one side and 9 volts on the other. That gives us a difference of 1 volt. So we know our voltage. Now what else do we know? Let's say that the current meter says we have a current of 1 amp. So now we know our voltage, that's 1 volt. Our current is 1 amp. So we know the voltage, we divide into it, and 1 volt divided by 1 amp gives us 1 ohm of resistance. So let's say now we have that same 1 ohm of resistance, but we have 
30 volts on one side, 20 volts on the other, that's a difference of 10 volts. So we have a resistance of 1 ohm. We know our voltage, which is 10 volts. We divide 10 by 1. That gives us a current of 10 amps. Now in this case, we see we have a resistance of 10 ohms and a current of 5 amps. We don't know our voltage, so we multiply. 10 times 5 equals 50 volts. Some people use this memory aid to help them remember the formula for Ohm's Law. We have E on top to remind us to always divide into our voltage, and then we have our resistance next to our current to remind us if we know those, we multiply. I'm not going to say much more about Ohm's Law because we are going to go over that again and again as we discuss different circuits. So just remember, if you know your voltage, divide into it. If you don't know your voltage, multiply. Now that we've taken a look at Ohm's Law, let's take a look at a couple more scenarios. Once again, we don't know what's going on over here, and we don't know what's going on over here. We have an unknown resistance and an unknown current, but we do have voltage, and the voltage is the same on both sides of the resistor. So to have a difference in voltage, we must have two things, current and resistance. Let's see which one is missing. The current meter says I have 2 amps. So if I have current, but there's no voltage difference, I must have a bad resistor. Can that happen? Sure, resistors can short out, and you can have actually 0 ohms of resistance in a resistor. But we have other components that act like resistors too. For example, a transistor, depending on exactly what it's doing at the moment, may have resistance, and it may not. If this is actually a transistor and we expect it to have resistance, it doesn't. So that's a bad transistor. However, if we expect this transistor to have no resistance at the moment, it's doing exactly what we expect and it's a good transistor. Let's look at one more scenario. Once again, we don't know what's going on here. We don't know what's going on here. Unknown resistance, unknown current. We do know these two voltages and they're different. Therefore, I must have current and I must have resistance, correct? So let's see how much current we do have. Oh, zero amps. Is this possible? I have a difference in voltage, but there's no current. Well, what if this is an open circuit? Let's say that resistor has burned open. Now, there's no connection from one side to the other. And so these voltages are actually not connected with each other. Something's going on over here that's giving us 8.2 volts. Something's going on over here that gives us 1.3 volts, but there's no connection across them. And since there's no connection across here, I can't have any current. So there's my zero amps of current. So here's a situation where we could be fooled into thinking we had a good resistor there where we actually have an open resistor. So if we have voltage across a resistor, but no current, that resistor is an open circuit and needs to be replaced. So what have we learned? We've learned that electricity is a fluid and it acts much like air. And we can make electricity flow through a conductor much like we can make air flow through a soda straw. And if we offer a resistance to that flow of electricity, we'll get a backup of electrical pressure or voltage where that current flows into the resistance and a drop in electrical pressure or voltage where the current exits the resistance. So whenever we have current flowing through a resistance, we get a difference in voltage from one side to the other. So if we have a resistance and we have no current flowing through it, the voltage is the same on both sides. It might be 10 volts on each side. It might be 100 volts. It might be 1,000 volts. But if we have no current flow, the voltage will be the same on both sides of the resistance. But when we have resistance and current flow, we get a higher voltage where the current enters the resistor and a lower voltage where the current exits the resistor. So there's a voltage difference, but we must have resistance and current flow to get that difference. We also learned about Ohm's law. We have resistance, we have voltage, and we have current. And with Ohm's law, if we know two of those, we can calculate the third. If we know our voltage, we divide into it. So if we know our voltage and our current, divide the current into the voltage, that tells us the resistance. If we know our voltage and our resistance, 
we divide the resistance into the voltage and that tells us our current. If we don't know our voltage, we multiply. So we multiply our current times our resistance and that tells us our voltage. We also learned that electrical current is measured in amperes or amps. And an amp is simply a number of electrons passing by in a second. So if we have a certain number of electrons go by in one second, we have one amp of current. We also learned that if we have one amp of current going through a resistor and there is one volt across that resistor, that could be 10 volts and 9 volts, or it could be 100 volts and 99 volts. But if the difference is one volt and the current is one amp, we have a resistance of one ohm. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe and hit that gray bell also because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible and a big thank you to everyone for watching.